Okay. Go ahead, Harlan Chapman interview, take two. You look handsome, sir. Well, thank you. If I could see you, I could comment on your, what you look like. <laughs> Were you uh, part of the Hanoi March? Yes. Let's talk about the Hanoi March. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, I was in a, 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 a camp that the uh, was outskirts of Hanoi, rural area. The, the camp had no electricity in, in the cells. And uh, I was there with Rod Knutson, and my roommate, for a long, quite, quite a while. And uh, we did not go on the march because I had gotten caught talking. I was a senior person in the in the building. There were oh, probably uh, well, there were just four, four or five cells anyway. And I got caught talking, and so that's when they put me in the handcuffs behind my back, and Ron had to feed me and wipe my butt. And uh, so we heard about the walk from to the tactical of the, of the POWs that went, you know. And, but I didn't. Rod and I didn't go because I was in. I was. <laughs> I was being penalized. <laughs> So I did not go on the march. I, I remember the march and hearing about it, and I've seen pictures of it now, but I did not participate in the march because I was, a, I was being punished. So, um, was, what was your experience of what you knew about what was going on back home in terms of, were you aware of the work that was being done to try to bring you home? Well, in most of the camps, uh, twice a day, we had Radio Hanoi, and we would get news, and it, there would never be any good news about the U.S. It would all be bad news. Who was killed? Who was a big fire catastrophe here? Plane crash there? And all the, and the, the, the lies about all the number of U.S. planes that they shot down. We'd get that garbage. Uh, Twice a, twice a day, so there was a speaker in the room. So that was really our, our only outside current knowledge except when it got a new shoot down in and the word got funneled through the, through the communication network on uh, how things had changed in the U.S. And we're, talk to me about the, when those communications would come through. I imagine in the years you were there, just you must have been so hungry for any kind of news about. Oh yeah, we always. You know, but I don't know. You sort of get numb. I don't know. But no, you're always looking for news. But you know, like we didn't. It was six months or a year after the moon landing that we found out about that. And the only reason we found out about that it was given away by one of the interviews that they had uh, POW giving interviewing one of the supposedly nice people that came over to interview the POWs. Were you ever, uh, what was your experience of the Cuban um, era? There were Cuban... Concerned and worried about them because as far as when we're forced to write on something like that, we could really write like, like I am very sorry that I got caught or talking instead of, instead of saying I'm sorry <laughs> that I got, uh, you know, just you could change the language around. But the, the Cubans knew English and they were good at it. So, but fortunately, I had very little dealing with them. But the POWs that did had a hell of a time because they were really working on them to get into a uh, almost a type of, I don't know what you call it, where a response just to do something, you know. And uh, they, they were tortured a lot and beat up a lot. And 
I'm sure you'll find out a lot more by if you're interviewing any of the ones that got interviewed by the that was in the Cuban program. Yeah. But there was, it was I felt sorry for those guys. Um, but I didn't know much about it except, you know, the word about the, the Cubans were there and uh, the uh, trying to, uh, well, when you, you teach a dog to do things, well, they're trying to teach a POW to, to do things and uh, mind control type of stuff. And you couldn't pull anything screwy with them as far as language because their English was perfect. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> A lot of what we hear about in the uh, Hanoi prison system is the um, remarkable leadership. But one of the th aspects um, that has come to light as well is that <clears throat> in order for there to be a remarkable leadership, there also has to be exemplary f followership. That the junior ranking officers, the way you all pull together um, and, and disseminated information and uh, dedicated yourself to, to the code of, of back US, other things. Can you speak to me about that? Do you, because Ev talked about the brotherhood, like the, 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 one of the things that the Vietnamese could never really understand and break was this bond of brotherhood that all of you shared. Hmm. It was just there, it was part of. Well, just part of your military training, and uh, well, just they're your comrades, your buddies. They're in the same deep shit you're in, and uh, so you know this. <laughs> you know this. Uh, when you're in the same trouble together, there's a bond that that's formed. Uh, I don't know what you would call it, but it, it's it's just it's just there. And uh, you know, he's not, he's not richer, he's not poor, he's not necessarily smarter or dumber or anything. He's another POW that got stuck on in a terrible situation. And he's stuck like I am. And he's, uh, you know, well, this. And there's no difference, white, black, yellow, or anything. It's, uh, you know, so that's, that's where I'm at. I, I think that's pr pretty much the common thing throughout the, the POW group. Did you know Fred Cherry at all? Very well, not not very well, but yeah, you know, but lots of time to talk to him after we got out and uh, right before he got out. Just one heck of a nice guy, just very personable, very friendly. And, Tell me a little and bit I about actually, Well, uh, I actually uh, know Porter Halliburton a little bit better and I remember when Got to, in fact, I saw them put Fred in the cell with Porter, or Porter in the cell with, uh, and when I was looking out to under the door and such, and I saw a black guy, and that was the first black that I knew up there. And then the word came that, that they put him in with Porter Halliburton, who was a Southern boy. <laughs> and I thought, well, let's leave it to the gooks to try and stir up trouble, but you know, there wasn't, as far as I know, I don't think there was any any trouble between two great guys. They formed a remarkable friendship, honestly. There's yeah. a, a yeah. wonderful book called Two Souls Indivisible. I don't yeah. know if you've looked at it. Yeah, well, they're both just super nice people. Yeah. You know, just, I know Porter a lot better. Uh, we've met him a few times at different occasions and such. And you know, I, I know Fred, but not as well as I know Porter. I've always had a lot of respect for both of them. Yes. I, I have a deep regret that we weren't able to interview Fred before he passed on, because yeah. I think he was a remarkable man. Yes. And, um, Air Force pilot, and, and you know, uh, apparently, I don't know if you've heard this story, but he was uh, flying with uh, a wingman. Uh, they were doing, uh, I, I guess they were, uh, um, it was not in combat situation, but the wingman went to deploy his landing gear and it would only deploy part way. And Fred told him to hold a five degree attitude and he went up underneath him with his wing and forcibly pushed down the landing gear on his jet. Oh, I hadn't in, heard that one. In air. Wow. And then That's when they got back down, 
of course, word of would have gone through the camp about this, and Fred expected that people would come up and acknowledge, but because of the color of his skin, all of the white officers stayed off in a corner, didn't say a word to him. So he fought that his whole life, and um, he was just a remarkable guy, hmm. remarkable guy. So um, this... Uh, Your stepsons have talked about their deep respect for you. Um, well, I was very proud of both of them. It's just yeah. terrible that one passed away. I'm so sorry. I, yeah. I lost a son myself. I know. Yeah, then you know it's the yeah. whole never goes away. But yeah. very proud for me to yeah. commission and actually to have both of them be naval aviators was I was very proud of. And uh, the uh, the one the one that still it was a hell of a was a Cobra pilot in the first Gulf War and got, off to, uh, got out after the war because they saw the military shrinking and became a policeman in uh, San Diego and uh, was for a year or two and then got into the FBI and he was on a surveillance team with uh, the FBI and he flew fixed wing aircraft for the uh, FBI and he just uh, retired last year from the F FBI on his, well, he had enough years in with his service in the rank or to retire. And now he has a job with a helicopter company and he's back to flying helicopters. <laughs> wow, wow. <coughs> um, what was the first time you heard the words return with honor? Do you remember? <laughs> Reisner's book. <laughs> no. Uh, no, it was. I, I. I can't. But there was. The word was. You know. And. Uh, no, it was. First in, first out. After the second wounded. You know. That was. That was it. And. Uh, the. The return with honor was never a factor uh, on that until later. I don't, there's nothing I can put Not my a finger. specific thing you can pinpoint, but no. at a certain point, I believe Stockdale CAG was the, was the um, architect of the return with honor. There was a certain point where it came down yeah, through yeah, the ranks. Right. Yeah. These three words. This yeah. project is called Return with Honor. Yeah. And I know that for you, sir, honor means a great deal. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to me about honor, about those who have instilled it, inspired you about it, and also the ways that you feel that you have tried to live that for those who could be inspired by you? Mm. <laughs> I like being respected, and I don't see how you can be respected without being honorable. And that's, you know, that's pretty much it uh, in, in a brief thing. It's, uh, it's just what I grew up with. Uh, you didn't steal, you you know, you're, I like this decent people. And uh, if you're a decent person, as far as I'm concerned, you're honorable. And uh, there's a lot of different aspects of being decent, but. Um, I respect, you know, very fortunate that I'm an American citizen. You know, just, I give thanks every day for being an American. That's, uh, so. You see some of the tragedy of these horrible things that are happening in these other countries with the floods and the tor tornadoes and the terrorist bombings and such and things. Wow, I'm an American. I'm here in the in the USA. Fat and comfortable. And leading an honorable life is not always a simple thing. Sometimes it involves some tough choices. Can you? Is there ways that you ins have inspired your own children about making honorable choices and what it means? No, it's just uh, <clears throat> very fortunate. Uh, you know, particularly, particularly the boys have been, you know, t 
to my knowledge, you know, very honorable, and both of them were officers of the military and such. The uh, the daughter has uh, was a, we had some problems with her in her teenage years, but that's not that unusual, and she's turned out to be quite the artist, and we're very proud of her artistic abilities, and she's you know had done some major artwork and uh, such, and uh, she's been a good mother to her kids, and so I'm very fortunate. And my son, I'm, I'm sorry, that, you know, they, they didn't have any kids and never, I could never delve into whether it was a physical thing or a dis mental decision, but I'm very proud of him as far as his work as a chemist and just as far as being a very decent, nice person. And his, his wife is brilliant. She's just so smart. She just knows everything. Just, and they have a nice relationship, so very fortunate. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and particularly Harlan, who's gotten this since he retired as a chemist a number of years ago, with the photography, he's really gotten into you know some real deep photography, actually going on trips with other artists, photography type of such. And he has a lot in common with the stepdaughter that's the artist, because a lot of his artwork is artistic type, and a lot of his photography is so. They do. They they get together a lot, and his mother is in Denver. So when he goes to see his mother in Denver, he always pops up to see uh, Dawn in uh, Boulder. So they they see each other quite a bit, which is nice. <clears throat> there were obviously um, things that helped sustain you during your time in the North Vietnamese and the. Vietnam prison camps, and I'm sure one of it was your your hope for your return, uh, you know, and and like Ed Alvarez, like uh, uh, Charlie Plum, uh, you got news just prior to your return that the wife that you expected you were going to be with wasn't was no longer going to be there, and I I think of your the way you've accepted that and moved on is really remarkable, but can you talk to me about those events and, and how you dealt with them? Well, you know, I, every day I, I, I prayed for uh, Harlan and uh, uh, Buzz, you know, and, uh, and I, I, but I did that every night in my, my, my prayers. And uh, then when I found out uh, about uh, my wife, you know, it it hit me, and I laid in bed and thought about it for a while, and I thought, I should after seven years, I'm not going to let it ruin my life. And the more I thought about it, I could understand the the amount of time that I spent away, because right before her son was born, I went to Japan for 13 months unaccompanied. Uh, I left for Vietnam in uh, May of '65 uh, and didn't get back until '73. That's a lot of time to be away, so you know I don't blame her. And uh, she was good. She didn't spend all the extra money I got as far as being the extra pay that you get for being locked up. So I had a, a nice chunk of change. I got back, and we had an admiral. Uh, you know, a friendly type of divorce, and uh, so there's no, you know, there's no hate or hurt and such on, on my part. You know, I, I can understand it, and uh, and fortunately, I was able to establish, I think, a good relationship with my son. When I got back, uh, I had three months leave, and I took a, a month of that or a few weeks of that to take Harlan to. Uh, uh, Three weeks in in Europe, and we bounced around from Norway down to Italy, and uh, had a had a great time. I, I, <coughs> you have my ad admiration and respect for the ways that you approached that change. Um, uh, as Charlie, and, and maybe we can talk about this. There are those who are visited with tragedy and travail and end up bitter and angry. And those who, as Charlie said, if I realized the bitterness could only fester in me 
and, and I, I didn't want to be bitter. Um, Harlan, actually, um, uh, Porter told us the story that is he was, when you were all heading to the sea, to the transports at the, at the airfield, as he was leaving the Hanoi Hilton, he turned around and looked at the place and just said alone to himself and to the buildings, I forgive you. And mm -hmm. he said he walked away and never felt oh. any rancor. And I feel that in you, that you have, yeah. um, and, I, and I think it's an important question for, you know, some of the questions that the military is working with with PTSD uh, no. is to talk to me about bitterness and... No. Oh, there were, most of the guards were, uh, they were decent, you know, they didn't go out of their way to try to make, but there were occasional, a few of the guards that, you know, were, were sort of mean and nasty, but they were basically doing their job. And uh, so I can't, I can't knock, knock them. That was, you know, part of <laughs> being a prisoner. So uh, I'm not bitter in, in, in that aspect. Uh, I'm a hell of a lot more bitter to, about Jane Fonda than I am about any of the guards in the camp. So, <clears throat> oh, I had a patch made when I had the squadron. <clears throat> and the, and the, my flight jacket has had a loop on it that come, came down and covered the top of the patch. And the patch showed Snoopy. And you lifted the pap, and Snoopy was there with his finger up and said, Fuck Jane Fonda. <laughs> yes. uh, so you learned how to uh, privately uh, uh, protest in your own way. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> So, but no, as far as, no, I, I don't have any, any, any rancor or uh, uh, anything for, you know, that's, why, why do that and screw up your own life? I, I think if you've got rancor, you, you're not doing the people that you're pissed off at any good, you're just hurting yourself. That's, Beautiful, sir. That's my thought. What did what role did your faith play in your well-being, your health, your attitude toward your life? I prayed a lot. I was uh, not a major church goals. I was baptized a Methodist. Uh, I occasionally went to church at Easter and Christmas type of thing. I was not an avid uh, churchgoer, but. Uh, oh. I, I prayed a lot in prison. You know, it was, I had a lot of time to, to stare at the ceiling and talk to God. And, that, and, and that basically, I, I, I prayed for the health, happiness, and long life of my family. You know, and the, just that was the, you know, I was just prayed that they'd be okay. That was my major, my major prayer. Still is today. And when you returned to the United States, as Charlie uh, Plums told me at one point, he said, you know, in many ways, we were the only good thing that the government had that came out of Vietnam. And so you were paraded and, and given a lot of support well, in, in ways know. that many other returning veterans did not. How yeah. did that, how did you look at that whole time period? Well, I felt sorry, no, we were getting a lot of accolades and <clears throat> We didn't realize until after the accolades and we got back and such, as far as the acrimony and such that so many of the returning veterans got, we didn't, I didn't know about that, you know. And I, I, you know, I think it was awful. But then again, the uh, war is dirty, nasty and such, and when you've got leaders that are screwed up, don't, well, anyway, I won't go there. No said there. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. And was there a point <clears throat> when the fanfare died and you started to find your way back into your life that you realized you were back on, you were back, that, that you know, like a, in, in many ways, getting on that transport and calling out as it was, you know, wheels up and you were getting free was one thing, but it was another thing entirely when you began to just have life. Well, <clears throat> then they uh, went to Oakland because that's where uh, my, my wife and uh, son were at the time, the hospital there in Oakland. 
And they had a pretty nice setup there. The, there was beer in the refrigerator, and uh, we were basically kept in the hospital as far as the security because we were sort of like celebrities. And uh, they wanted to brief us as far as, as far as if we knew about any POWs, any names, anything else, anything. So a, a series of briefings there. And we were also given liberty uh, to go from the hospital. And uh, so I took liberty and went back to Colorado because <clears throat> that's when my sister and brother-in-law and my folks were there at that time. And uh, so I went back to visit them one of the weekends and met Fran. She was a friend of my niece. Uh, there. My niece is only 13 years younger than I am. She was, uh, so anyway, that's why I met Fran. And then uh, we had a, a phone relationship and then we had the, uh, the, the dinner at the White House and I took Fran. <laughs> Nothing like trying to uh, impress someone. How would you like to, well, before that, we went to uh, dinner at uh, Reagan's in California. And I flew her out for that. And anyway, we, we hit it off and we just sort of seemed to put it together. And, but I wasn't going to do anything for a year, so we just sort of, uh, when I get across country, I'd fly into Colorado. But, uh, we, and I dated, and I'm sure she did and such, and after a year we decided that well, we'd, we'd try and put it together and see what we could do. And it's worked out, hasn't it? She's I, there. I have to say, you really know how to court a girl, taking <laughs> her to the White House and the Reagan Ranch. Come on, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I even sent her, the, the little boy who told about the... All the, the Imperiums. I, I said... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because my time in Hawaii, I knew about, I, I sent her a whole bou bouquet of pantheriums. <laughs> oh, you're, a, you're just a doll. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Aristotle is quoted as saying, one acquires honor by continually acting in an honorable way. There are those who say, okay, this is honor and this is honor, but there are those who earn their honor by their actions. Can you speak to examples of that when you, that you saw in the Hanoi prison systems? People who inspired you. Uh, Stockdale, Reisner, just so many. Denton, uh, you know, the, the ones that, you know, that were really treated, you know, that were in solitary for years. You know, I was only in solitary for six months or nine months. Uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, there were a lot of heroic guys. In fact, most of the guys that, you know, are in the, in the NAMPOW. They wouldn't be in the NAMPOW if they weren't well respected by other POWs. And what more respect than you want than, you know, to, to have a friendship with other POWs. Yeah. Do you remember any specific examples of Denton or uh, Stockdale that, that you witnessed, that, that you realized, because so many people have talked about I kept going because I watched what they did to CAG or Denton or you mm. know, Bill Lawrence or others, and they just inspired me. Oh, boy. Because so much I just found out later, you know, about uh, with the uh, blinking, using the blinking eyes about torture and, uh, uh, well, different guys that went through serious, you know, long type, uh, like Reisner, uh, you know, they, uh, it was pretty much throughout, you know, everybody pretty much did their job to the best of their abilities. And uh, some were tougher than others, some were, were not as tough, but that, that didn't make them any less of a, a good person. They're just, uh, 
you know, but Reisner and, and Stockdale and uh, uh, they, they they rise to the top of them, and and they're you know, no, I can't you know. Yeah. There's just you know there's so many and such I can't pick out because any specific one that was you know stood out outside of the the highest rankers there. And if you would, sir, um, <clears throat> speak to me about uh, there had to be a, had been times when your spirits were at a low, when you were feeling. You know, this is really, really hard. What were the kinds of things that sustained you? Well, Christmas time was always tough. Uh, you know, thinking about family, and uh, but occasionally they would give us a little bit of food or something at Christmas. Uh, there's always the hope, and so. Uh, I can't really, you know, there was always hope. And that's the only thing that kept you going is the hope and able to, able to tap to the guy next door. And uh, that was, you know, just continue to, you know, to try and be a good POW and uh, hang on and hope for, the, hope for the best. It was frustrating when we started thinking about the, the, the well, one of the things that sort of aggravated us was when they stopped the bombing and they didn't even get us recognized as POWs instead of prisoners, as far as those criminals. We were treated as criminals, not prisoners of war. And I uh, thought that to stop the bombing without even doing that or having the Red Cross being, bringing in packages and such, you know, I thought was pretty shitty of the government to do that. That was a, that was sort of a low point for me as far as, you bastards, you know, you, you, you stopped it and you didn't get us anything. Uh, so, but I don't need to go <laughs> any further that way. Right, right. When you arrived at, <coughs> at Unity, things began to change. Uh, Ho Chi Minh had died, correct? And yes. you saw some changes. Yes. And, and, and talk to me about that time. You, you began to each, like different people would have classes and things that, you know, you started to create, not, not just survive, but actually create. Oh, yeah, a lot of things from, uh, well, even have a uh, speech inspection where you, you'd have to give a little talk and then you'd be judged as far as whether how many times you did uh-huh or whatever and uh, of course there was the uh, uh, it was great when we started getting packages and we got cards in to you know to play bridge and I played played a lot of bridge so <laughs> play uh, played a hundred thousand points <laughs> for a case of beer or a case of booze <laughs> wow. but you know when you got you now you could send most of the day you know, a lot of the days you know it was but that was just a short period of time that that, that happened. But you no, know, the classes were good, and all sorts of different classes talking. Just. Do you remember any classes that you participated in that were? Oh. No, not spe not specifically. No. It was pretty remarkable, the ways that all of you created with what you had. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I know that uh, Shoemaker was quite smart with oh, numbers and was figuring oh, yeah. out. Oh, yeah, he was brilliant, yeah. Calculating, and he, he built the, his entire house in his head. Yeah. And we actually filmed the house that he built. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah, we actually... Uh, oh, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah was, oh, he was brilliant, yeah. I never lived with him, so I didn't know him well, but uh, I know he's brilliant, just a... And very personable one little bit of contact I've had with him. Some have talked about um, that in some ways when conditions got better at the camp, 
actually there were ways in which living with so many people became in some ways more difficult. People who mm. now were no longer just surviving you might feel irritated at the smaller things that before were insignificant to them. Did you experience anything along that line? Trying to rock my brain. Nothing significant that stuck with me on it. Uh, no, nothing. Uh, no, I just didn't have one bunk next to me that snored too loud or anything. I'd, No, I can't think of anything, uh, anything significant that, uh, that bugged me on, uh, on that aspect. But. So now in your present day life, you have a home up in Vermilion, Ohio. You have this home here in, uh, in beautiful Tucson. You come, uh, you, clearly you're a gardener, you enjoy plants. And um, what, My wife is a gardener. Oh, she is. <laughs> Uh, it's a, but both of you, I noticed out on the porch, were watching and seeing, and this, yeah. so, and I. Uh, Carrie is a more recent gardener. Uh, we have a home in Santa Fe, and only in the okay. last couple of years has she really started mm -hmm. to take a complete interest. And she's a very impatient gardener. Like the seed went in the ground, and she's standing there, kind of, where is it? <laughs> you know, so I have to keep it saying, you know, it takes years. You, it's, Does she talk to it? <laughs> no, that's what's missing, I think. Yeah, she so, got to Fran talks to him. Ah, uh, that's great. But the idea that that all gardeners know that it's the changes that happen year after year that start to be the thing. You know, like that's you go out each morning and look for the changes, and Carrie's starting to have that happen for. Her. And I think of that as. It is one of the things that I've learned from you and your fellow former POWs is to really appreciate what can happen with time. Mm -hmm. Like that it's the little things, the little things you say from your experience that have meant so much to me. Um, mm -hmm. And in that light, uh, in your life today with your children and your your wonderful wife, and what, what does freedom mean to you? When you walk out in the desert, what, do, do you have it, does it have a special meaning to you? That you realize those around you may not feel because of, they didn't go through having it taken away. Mm. Boy, that's a deep one. <laughs> I'm just very thankful and I, that, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so fortunate, I keep saying, I'm, I'm so fortunate that we were able to, with my retirement and with both of us working, that we have the facility now to, to live six months in Ohio with the beautiful summer weather, the lake, and everything else. And I like Ohio, but in the winter, being by the lake, it's never sunny because of the lake moisture from the lake, it's cloudy every day. And here in Arizona, it's sunny every day. During, so we're very, very fortunate to, to be able to spend the nice summers by the lake, fishing and boating and sailing, racing and that, and then come to beautiful Arizona for the sunshine. So, and I have a beautiful wife and the, the, the kids are great. The grandkids are, are doing fine. The, the great grandson is growing, what, what's Brooks, uh, what's? Uh, Cam's gonna be six. It's gonna be six, so. So the family is growing and uh, the, uh, one of the granddaughters just uh, got, got married not too long ago from, uh, he's uh, uh, Puerto Rican? No, not, not Puerto, uh, uh, Brazilian. Brazilian. He's a doctorate on a doctorate program and she's working on her uh, master's in uh, social, work. social work. When, and, what does, does the landscape have a particular appeal to you, the, the mountains here and the cactus? Can you speak a little bit about that? Oh, I enjoy, particularly if you're up on a hill and driving down and seeing it, the mountains. And, you know, sometimes there, it's, a, it's almost a 360 degree view of mountains. You know, just, you know, just pretty, and it's really pretty the short times that there's a little bit of snow on it and uh, such. So, you know, and this is, we're, 
we're normally not out here at this time with all the flowers budding. We, we've been some, but to see all the all the flowers is just amazing. I never realized that there were that many pretty flowers coming from cactus, and there were so many cactus. Well, there's there's just a lot to do here with Green Valley. It's it's a great for for older people. It's just there's always something. If you're bored here, you, it's your own fault because with the classes that are available for uh, adults and uh, whether it's uh, glass blowing or art or golf or whatever you you want, and uh, we get the two the uh, Tucson some of the orca, orca <coughs> excuse me comes down at least two or three times to work to Green Valley. We get major programs and such through uh, uh, the college down there, and it get. Uh, uh, like I had a great uh, discussion and great decisions, and it's great decisions as far as the history of great decisions that have been made and what could be made and such as far as uh, in our history. It was a very, very good class. And, uh, and then we had a sci also had a science class that just talked about the different recent things in science. And uh, you know, it was run by two instructors and then just a discussion within the class with the different experiences of different things that they've read, that we've, the, the class reads in the paper that they bring up for discussion. So there's just, it's just a fantastic place for, you know, for older people. It's yeah. a playground for adults. <laughs> Do you ever take a walk or sit outside alone and just reflect on your fortune and your freedom now? Occasionally, yeah, but, uh, but uh, unfortunately, my when we went to uh, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico for uh, a, a dozen winters, and I used to walk the boardwalk there by myself or with other friends, and we'd we'd walk maybe three or four miles a day on the boardwalk back and forth, and. Uh, just look at the ocean and, uh, or I should say, the bay and the tourists and such. And that was, so I got a lot of my exercise that way. I really miss that. But now, either because of my spinal stenosis or the Alzheimer's, you know, I think both of them are affecting my ability to walk. I can walk 100 yards, but then I've got to sit down. And I can't do 200 yards without taking a break. And uh, it's very frustrating. It's frustrating on my wife because she loves to go for walks and she likes to go for walks with me and I hate to say I don't feel like it today honey yeah. I know that's, that's that's one of the tougher things right now I really understand I really do and it's it's the vulnerability of life yeah, yeah. Is sometimes age hits you in the back of the head <laughs> or in the back of the knees <laughs> I understand um, if you had a chance to go back in time and meet yourself as a young man, is there anything that you particularly would want to tell yourself that, as guidance? <laughs> I thought a confessional was a private. <laughs> Um, no, I, I've, I've done some stupid things in my life, but, you know, I, you know, I almost got killed. I fell asleep coming back when I was in basic school. And uh, the other guy, and we had <clears throat> date down at this college campus, and we're driving back to the base at, late at night, and I fell asleep at the, at the wheel. I wasn't drunk or anything, fell asleep at the wheel. And the car went off the road. And uh, fortunately, it climbed a tree instead of dead on. But uh, I had a, uh, in fact, he's still a friend that was <clears throat> with me in the car. He was not hurt at all. I, I had a bunch of scars on my face and everything. And I was banged up and in the hospital for a few days. But. Uh, Fortunately, I didn't go across the road and kill anybody on that, so I give thanks that I went off the right side of the road and hit a tree, and it was just myself and my 
that Dick was not uh, seriously injured. In fact, we just saw him not too long ago. We were filming at the Naval Academy and we're doing this uh, beautiful spot with gym, the gymnasts, the guys who can do these remarkable, yeah. remarkable things. And uh, the young man who was sort of featured in the spot, who could do, whoops, who could, <laughs> did I just you check out the framing? I don't think, I think I hit the, the young man who was featured in the spot um, <clears throat> had exactly that same thing happen to him. Um, mm. In his case, he actually, I think there was some alcohol involved and fell asleep at the wheel and was killed. And it's, you were just with him a couple months before and he was, he could do the Iron Cross. He was had this yeah. incredible vitality, really. Yeah. And you just feel that fragility and the uncertainty yeah. of things. And so it must, you know, I'm proud to know you as little as I do and to see you reaching the fullness of, of your life and, and that you've had so much. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, for me, uh, one other question I had for you uh, in your experience is there was an evening and a number of, of, of your former POWs, uh, fellow former POWs have told this story one night and I'm not sure whether it was in the zoo or plantation or where, but someone, I think it was a bombing raid was happening and someone began to sing God Bless America. And then others picked it up or, and until you were all, or all of them were singing in unison, the guards came in and really descended upon people trying to break it up, but they continued to sing. Was that something in your experience? Were you part of that camp? I wasn't, I wasn't at that camp at that time. I was up to the camp that was by the Chinese border at that ah, time. The zoo, I, right? Was that no, the zoo? No, 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 no. It's, uh, I can't think of it now. Uh -huh. No, the zoo is the main, one of the main camps that was right there in Hanoi. So I just wanted to check if you were there that night because it no, I, 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 I heard about it. Oh, you did? Through the, through the wall? No, later. Oh, oh, oh really? <laughs> it was different. Yeah. yeah. It was a long way away at that, at that time. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, the wall, the tap code, it became a source of communication and information, but it was also in my understanding, um, a source of brotherhood and um, uh, encouragement, lots of things. Like there was, a, there was an emotional component for sometimes just taking your, the hardships of the day to the wall. Could you speak to me about that? Well, that's, that's the reason that the, the, the Vietnamese tried to keep us separate and not Communicating with anyone except the person in your, in your cell with you, and they, you know they got harsh penalties if they caught you talking with anybody else because they knew in unity and strength. Well, tap code gave us that unity, so that's what gave us strength. Is the not that, but the ability to communicate is what gave us hope because you got back from a bad. Uh, interrogation and uh, you got slapped around or got beaten with a fan belt or something, it was nice to come back and tap to the guy next door and say, yeah, it was tough, but I'm okay, you know? And uh, it's just, uh, just to have someone there, you know, that's the, uh, we're not really, well, I guess there are hermits, but we're not really hermits. We like to have some support and uh, so. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, I, that's my questions. I, I don't, don't want to overtax you. Is there anything that you, I might not have thought of that you might want to speak to about your experience or that I might not have touched on? Mm. The, um, I thought that uh, Stockdale did a good thing that Sybil wrote a book along with Stockdale. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's very good to see what the wives went through 
and such, it wasn't easy for them. And also, it's difficult for some of the problems when POWs got back, uh, they still had their wife, but then there were problems because she was used to running the show and then all of a sudden he's there and there's been friction for the friction between POWs, you know, with their wives and such that some of them haven't done as well as if the wife hadn't stuck around for them. So there's a lot of different Excuse aspects. Me, sorry. There's a lot of different, <coughs> sorry, go ahead. There's a lot of different aspects of it and uh, in a way, I'm very fortunate. I've got a very lovely wife and some great uh, a son and great stepchildren and grandson and great grandson. So, and uh, I just I got it all right. <laughs> but you're you're alluding to a really important factor here for those who have the support of family. Oh, it's such a powerful thing. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Well. And that's perhaps if you were going to speak to a young officer in training at the Naval Academy or anything else. I mean, it sounds like that's a piece of advice you might give if you have the chance. You know, respect and maintain your bonds with your family. Yeah. Basically. Don't don't forget your family. You know, that's uh. You know. It's, uh, sometimes it's difficult, and you know, like I say, with the, the times that I was uh, was away, and uh, but it was it fair to say that when you were a younger man, you didn't necessarily understand how. Oh. Like with time, you you. <laughs> There's a hell of a lot I didn't understand. <laughs> There's still a hell of a lot I don't understand. <laughs> But uh, take a day to take a day at a time and do the best you can. Yeah, beautiful, sir. Yeah, well, I used to say, used to one of my going to bed in, in jail. I say, uh, pray I make it through the night and get up in the morning and say, oh, thanks, I made it through the night. <laughs> so you know, just uh, well, it's so lovely to get to know you in any way, shape, or form. I really well, am appreciating it. We're gonna ask, uh, do the tap code. Let me again do one thing. Um, when you were describing the shoot down, you talked about pulling the alternate handle and you don't remember if right. you did, but you indicated. And I just need to do a close up of you reaching down as if you're gonna pull it. So just hang on, just a second. Right. And you could warm yourself into the story by just saying, you know, I tried to go for the... Yeah, because of the, because of the G-forces, I couldn't get my arms up higher than this. Just, the, you know, and the plane's tumbling, and uh, I feel like I'm going to die, and I can't get... Yeah. And then the next thing I remember, I'm in the chute coming down, and I have no idea I had of the ejection, as far as the ejection seat, seat. But there was a handle that's in between your legs and the plane just for that and the, the possibility that you can't reach the the face curtain for them for some reason so I must have pulled that I that I must have because I ejected from the plane and uh, I'm here and you're here <laughs> all right good that's what I needed okay so why don't we cut and then we'll set up the board okay I'm gonna what do you want to turn off sound uh, I'll, if you can hold on for one oh. moment Arlen we're just gonna ask oh. you to um, yeah, let me uh, okay. cut sound. Hold to on. Demonstrate.